Uh, hi, everyone. Christine Boucher here, CEO of Wellness Works. I deliver bespoke wellness programs to organizations. I also mentor other health coaches and healthcare professionals in breaking through into corporate health. What we're talking about today is organizational health and wellness benefits, but also if you're a wellness business owner, how you can break in to the corporate sector. Welcome back to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show, where we uncover the secrets of success and well-being in today's fast-paced world. I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga, and uh, let me tell you, today's episode is shaping up to be one for the books. I think, yeah, since I spoke to our next guest, I couldn't wait to get her on the show. We've got a guest who is not only changing the game, but also rewriting the rules altogether. I want you to get ready to meet Christine Bocha, a, pow a powerhouse in the healthcare industry who's turned uh, to become the CEO of Wellness Works. Now, Christine, first of all, I haven't butchered your last name, have I? <laughs> no. All good, Prosper. It's Christine Boucher. It's actually French, so you could say Boucher. Boucher. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, right. Now, you see, it, it comes with a bit of sophistication, and I'm hoping we're going to be handling all the work that you're bringing to the table with golden hands. And for those that are about to meet uh, Miss Boucher, here, like I said, she's a powerhouse behind the healthcare industry. Um, and also she's turned herself into the CEO of Wellness Works. Now, I think if you think you've seen it all or heard it all, I want you to think again, because Christine's journey, um, you know, from bedside care to the boardroom is nothing short of brilliance. And it is inspiring in and of itself. So buckle up, because like I said, this episode is going to be a roller coaster of insights laughter, and maybe a few aha moments. So let's dive in. Now, Christine, obviously, you're not French. Tell us a little bit about your journey from being that nurse to becoming a CEO of Wellness Works. And um, yeah, if you can walk us through how that transition came by. Thanks, Prosper, for that great introduction. And I love that, that transition and the, the way you frame that from bedside care to boardroom. I'm going to use that. That's really cool. So, yeah, I worked in the healthcare industry for over 20 years as a cardiothoracic intensive care nurse. So I saw the sick of the sick patients, you know, chronic diseases, cardiac disease, uh, very invasive procedures, uh, ventilators, dialysis, you know, bed bedside and and um, surrounded by machines and tubes. I saw the sick of the sick. And I worked in this space for, for many, many years. And after about 20 years, I, I found myself becoming frustrated. I found myself becoming complacent and I found myself becoming a little bit mm, annoyed at the system because what I was witnessing, as were my colleagues, and it was commonly communicated, we were seeing the same patients come in again and again with exacerbation of their disease. And we were sending them home to the same triggers, to the same poor lifestyle behaviours, sedentary lifestyle or smoking or drinking or poor nutrition or lack of exercise or lots of stress in their workplace. And now all those risk factors were contributing to the exacerbation of their disease. And what we would commonly see is the same patients come in getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And I witnessed a lot of sickness. I witnessed a lot of death. I witnessed a lot of emotional distress. And that was really challenging. And I thought to myself after being in this space for a long time, there has to be a better way. There has to be a different way. How can I, how can I really help people? Because that's what I'm about. That's what I care about. I want to help people. I want to help them be healthy and well. And I discovered uh, which was pretty new in Australia, where I'm from, is health coaching. It's I know it started in the US many years ago, 
um, but still relatively new in, in Australia. So I then became a health coach, which is essentially getting in front of people before they get sick around that preventative healthcare realm, being proactive and preemptive and taking all the right actions in order to reduce our risk of chronic disease in order to stay healthy and well, in order to stay out of hospital. And so when I started in this space about 10 years ago and started my business, Wellness Works, I was just working one-on-one with clients and I was really seeing the impact and the difference that was making, but I wanted to do more. I wanted to work with more people. So quite naturally and organically, that led me into organizations into the workplace into the corporate and that's the space I've been working in for the last 10 years because my ultimate goal is keeping people out of hospital but having said that I want to keep people well and healthy and contributing to their workplace contributing to their families and their finances, contributing to their communities and ultimately the economy. It makes good business sense. Uh, Most organisations that invest in their people and invest in wellness programs will see a six-fold return on investment. So they'll see a significant improvement in things like productivity, performance, efficiencies, communication, team dynamics, you'll get reductions in sick leave, absenteeism, stress leave, workers' compensation claims, staff turnover. So ultimately, investing in your people, it makes good business sense because you're investing in your business and you're going to have a healthier workforce, but you're also going to have a healthier business ultimately. So I'm really passionate and I absolutely love what I do And what I believe that I do at the end of the day is keep people out of hospital and traveling that, you know, changing that whole trajectory of their health journey so that they're continuing to to work and live and thrive as opposed to being laid up in a hospital bed. That's not fun. No one wants to do that. Absolutely. And especially the ones that you ended up working with. I think the furthest I've seen is on a TV show and they're questioning whether to pull the plug or not. And this would have been an everyday occurrence for you. Now, now, Christine, how, how does somebody get into that sort of level of, um, you know, work, especially in the nursing department? Because for all I know, when little girls are growing up, they just want to be a princess. And there you <laughs> are, you, you were nursing people maybe in their you know, on their deathbed, but some people you are obviously getting them to recover and sending them back home. Yeah, it's funny. I I don't ever recall dressing up in a fairy dress and wanting to be a princess. I actually was dressing up in a nurse's outfit and it had a red cross on the front. I had my first aid kit and I would just follow my seven brothers and sisters around so I could bandage them up. I could put a sling bandage on them. I could bandage their foot up. And I was from a very early age, about seven, totally intrigued. And I think that stemmed from when I had my tonsils out and I had, and I was in the hospital for a few days and I had this angelic nurse come in and she was very authoritative and very bossy and she had a clipboard and she told me off because I wasn't doing the right thing. I wasn't uh, eating or drinking or what whatever I was doing that was incorrect and she was bossing me about and I looked up to her like, wow, this is, this is the sort of person I want to be. I aspire to be a nurse. So I had that instilled in me from a very young age and I had lots of brothers and sisters to practice on and uh, I absolutely love working in that space for the time frame that I worked in that space but it just got to a point was how can we do this better how can I do it differently how can I help more people and that's what's led me into the workplace wellness space absolutely and uh, wow that's something else and I can only imagine what dinner time was like with your seven uh siblings you know especially or maybe christmas time when everybody else is talking about their jobs and you're counting how many people you've at least sent home um what what do the other siblings do 
Uh, oh, they've got a, a variety of positions from from building and office jobs, and uh, one or two are retired now. So they they're all got different positions. But what I do recall, which was quite funny at the time, was yeah, I was loved to share my stories around the dinner table, but my stories were often blood and guts and gore, and they're like, no, Chris, no, we don't want to hear any more. But that was a normal daily occurrence working in the emergency department, working in intensive care. Um, you certainly see what the average person doesn't see on a daily basis. And that's quite confronting and challenging because you're not only dealing with the physical, but you're dealing with the emotional and you're dealing with the emotions of family members who are, you know, traumatized and 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 distraught because their loved one is injured or sick. And so there is a real emotional drain on, you know, I take my hat off to any healthcare professional and particularly nurses that are working in that system and working in that uh, in that realm of, of people's emotions. It can be challenging and quite tiresome day after day. And I think that was really grained on me to the point where how can we do this better how can we keep people out of hospital? And that's my driving force. If I can keep one person out of hospital and well, then it's been a good day in business for me. Absolutely. And um, from what you're saying, largely our environment is usually what then causes people to go in these loops, um, which you started noticing a pattern of if somebody was maybe you know, with love and respect smoking, they would then come back again from with some sort of emphysema and now they can't breathe and tomorrow, you know, half their lungs are incapacitated and things of that nature. But they still go back to the very same things that are causing that. Now, please elaborate on how environment is very crucial to the well-being of, of people before, we, you know, they, they actually start getting sick. Yeah, that, that's right, Prosper. You know, there are so many risk factors that contribute to the main chronic diseases being heart disease, Australia's leading cause of death, stroke, type 2 diabetes. And all these risk factors, there are modifiable risk factors, which means that we are in control and we can change them, such as smoking, drinking, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, stress. We can actually change our cholesterol. We can change our blood pressure through all those mechanisms. So they're modifiable. That's what we're in control of. Then there's things that are non-modifiable that are risk factors, such as a sex, age, hereditary, uh, uh, culture. They're, they're risk factors that we can't change. But when we compare the modifiable with the non-modifiable, there's a whole lot of things we can be doing in our lifestyle and changing in our environment that will enable and empower us to live a healthier, better life and can completely reduce our risk of chronic disease or reverse our risk of, of those diseases. So that's what I love about the health coaching because it's working with the individual and it's understanding what their intrinsic motivators are, what's important to them, what are their values, what do they really care about, and then working with them to make those behavioural changes so ultimately they're not going back to the smoking, to the drinking, to the poor, unhealthy lifestyle, but they're taking the onus and responsibility and with that support and accountability of a coach, over time they're making those significant changes that ultimately will change that whole trajectory of their health journey so they're not going down the path of hospital, but they're going down the path of health. And that's what makes a, a big difference. And that's the difference that I'm seeing with my clients. I've seen some that are just obviously evidently from my experience heading towards the hospital door, but we've managed to do the behavioral changes, empower them, get them to take the onus and responsibility and action those changes in order to get those healthier, better results and end up on a healthier path. I like that. And you, you've you repeated the word responsibility a couple of times in, in this sort of uh, response. Now, are you saying people are to blame 
for their lack of well-being or is there something that's systemic or like you've mentioned culture and other things that are beyond their control? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's two sides of the coin. There are things that are hereditary, of course. There are things that are part of our genetic makeup that we do not have control over. Therefore, that is no fault. But there are so many things in our lifestyle, in our environment, that we can ultimately take that responsibility for and we can change. We are in the driver's seat of our own health and well-being. And if we choose to sleep in and then smoke a packet of cigarettes and drink a slab of beer, well, you know, on a daily basis, that may not be good choices, right? So it's about what are the little actions that I can take every day that are going to set me up for success that are going to promote and inspire um, and optimize my physiology and biology so that it is sustainable and so that it is energetic and vibrant and thriving. Mm. Now, Christine, I just put a blame on public holidays because if it wasn't for the public holidays, people would have binge drink and, um, you know, maybe watching the footy or something like that. But your career hasn't just been, um, you know, in, in, in Australia. It's spun through various sort of countries um, and, you know, you've been working in these sort of spaces. What, what, what are the sort of commonalities that you're finding, even like you said, there's cultural differences, but there has to be something common in all these different places that you've been to? I think, you know, what I'm noticing in workplaces, and this is particularly post-pandemic, that organisations are a lot more aware and mindful that investing in their people is an invest a good investment in their business. And I think that's really been highlighted post-pandemic that we really need to care and cater for our people. Our people essentially make what makes up a business and without them and without them being well and if they're laid up in a hospital bed, you know, it, the, the business will be suffering. So being proactive and preemptive and providing wellness support, education, coaching, facilitation, all the services that I provide to organisations puts them in good stead for not only their employees but ultimately for the business at large. And so I think, you know, the COVID in, in a sense has been beneficial because we're, we're more connected online so I can reach audiences, you know, far, far from my immediate community and I can support people anywhere around the world because we have that that connection online. And I see the common threads and the common themes in, in workplaces today is stress is significantly high. Most workplaces will have stress over 30%. Burnout is becoming a significant issue. The World Health Organization has seen it now as a disease that it is impacting about around about 40% in workplaces. And when someone gets the point of burnout, they're opting out. They're, they're basically stepping out of life and stepping out of the organisation. So if you've got 40% of your workplace is burning out because they're at capacity, because they're overwhelmed and overworked and, and overstressed, that they're not managing their stresses, then that's going to be significantly detrimental to the bottom line and to business as well as those individuals and their families that have to endure that problem. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really ultimately important that we, we take care and consideration for our staff, our people. Our people aren't just cogs in a wheel. They're made up of, you know, so many different factors, social, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual. And if we're not taking all those realms of people into consideration, then we're not really setting ourselves up for success as within a business. So we look at all those, those realms when we look at people and we find where there's, you know, when I go into an organisation, I'll do a needs analysis so it's not just a tick-the-box approach, here's the wellness program, because that's hit and miss. 
It's about understanding the uniqueness of that organisation. It's about un understanding the uniqueness of the individuals that work in the organisation. And through doing so, we can then put together a bespoke pro wellness program that's fit for purpose and actually gets results. Some of the results that I've attained with my corporate clientele is tenfold, a tenfold return on investment because we've just made those significant changes. Like when you look at something like staff turnover, the cost factor for that's around 60 to 70,000 every time someone walks out the door. You you're losing the intellectual property. And then you've got to go through the whole process again of interviewing, recruiting, training. It takes three months to get them up to speed. So you look at the cost factor of one person walking out the door. That's a heap of money, and that's a big hit to an organisation. So if you can keep them healthy, well, satisfied, happy, then you're going to get longevity, you're going to get good team dynamics, and you're going to get good profitability within the organisation. Absolutely, and thank you so much for taking us through that, and especially when you spoke about burnout, because so many people are having to then go back to jobs and, and I think a lot of businesses are forgetting this, that for the past two years, they were telling people that what their employees are doing is non-essential. Now, any rightful person in the depths of their mind, they are obviously telling themselves that whatever I'm doing is not needed, yet companies are still forcing people to continue doing the same mundane stuff and also maybe showing up to places that, um, you know, you know, where people could actually work from home. This is my own, you know, opinion and just my observation from what has been happening because so many people are just looking at, wait a minute, for the past two years, what I'm doing, nobody needed. And now I'm being forced to hand over these spreadsheets and it's not making sense, you know, at a human level. Now, in a world where burnout seems to be inevitable, well, these jobs need to be done. It has to happen. How would you then help individuals and organizations to prioritize well-being without sacrificing productivity? Mm, yeah. And I think um, it's 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 essential that we, you know, every, every job is essential, right? Every employee is essential, whether they're a cleaner or, or, or whether they're a CEO. Every component within an organisation is, is essential. The business cannot run effectively if there's gaps. But what I think is really important is that we really understand uh, the individual. What, what is their vision? What are their values? What do they care about? What do they really want to achieve? Let's harness those strengths. Let's empower them to engage them into opportunities in the workplace. And this is often missed. So you often have like the most clever people with a great skill set that are well undervalued and well underutilized, and they become bored and complacent. And then that, and if they're not engaged and if they're not excited about what they're doing, well, they may just go into the next workplace and you'll you'll lose a good employee. So as far as performance goes, performance is twofold. It's really, um, you know, the, the individual performing optimally so that the organisation benefits, but it's also the leaders within the organisation supporting the employees and understanding the employees and mentoring and empowering them in the capacity that they're going to thrive and they're going to be them best selves and they're going to travel a journey that excites and entices them to stay, that they're, they're loving. You know, they get up in the morning with a fire in their belly and can't wait to get to work as opposed to, oh, God, I think I might just call in sick today because I hate my job. You know, that's the sort of people that you want to really um, nurture within the business and 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 for the longevity, not just a one-off, on continuously. So when I work with businesses, not only do we do well-being education and facilitation and and, and coaching, we we'll do performance because well-being performance is actually very interrelated in my experience. So we will do, you know, working one-on-one -on -one and understanding those individuals and getting the best out of them. So therefore the organization will will benefit and, and it's a win-win for everyone. 
Mm. I mean, it's easy to get caught up in all these daily stresses, challenges, deadlines, KPIs, whatever life throws at us. And um, things seemingly are blaring these days with the advent of technology, you know, like Zoom. There's no in between uh, whether you're working or you're not, you know, just like right now, both you and I are working, but, you know, it's just blurred, um, you know, those lines. And it might be sort of um, tough. And sometimes for, of no fault of our own or anyone's, you know, people end up with a team that's stressed or burnt out and um, employees are struggling through every day, just trying to catch up. Now, we keep talking about burn, burn, burnout and it's a topic that's really close to home for a lot of us. Now, maybe can you share a personal experience or pivotal moment that actually shaped your approach to well-being, both your personal and professional life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can share with you my own personal experience of burnout. So I'm very hardworking, very driven, very thorough, and I do a lot of business planning and I'm often very busy. Um, and I got to a point where I had so much on my plate. I'm also a single mother raising two teenagers independently. So I have a lot on my plate. And a few years back, it got to the point where I myself, who am a role model and teaching others on this, was getting to a point of burnout and I had to have a really good look at what I was doing, why I was doing it, and I took a step back. So I, I was luckily in a situation that I was uh, able to, to step out of work and not worry about finances for just over four months, and we just went travelling, and every single day we just swam in the beach and we walked on the beach and we played tennis and we just relaxed and we connected and we got rid of our devices and we got rid of all the stresses and we just had to reevaluate our situation, particularly for myself. And I came to the conclusion, and this is a big learning for me and when I now teach other wellness businesses who are wanting to work in the space that I do, is around looking after self-care. Self is priority number one. And what I realized that I was missing in all my business planning, in my quarterly planning was it was all work, 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 but I hadn't factored in family, health, mm -hmm. social. I hadn't factored in all those other elements of, of my well-being that was so important. So that was a huge learning for me. So now when I do my business planning, I schedule in social events, I schedule in family events, I schedule in my exercise regime, I schedule in all the to-dos that are good for, for me so it's not all focused on just work alone that I don't get to that point of, of burnout again. Um, so that was a big wake-up call and something that I, you know, I share with organisations and I share with other businesses because when you're in uh, business, sometimes it can be a lonely journey. So I mentor other wellness businesses to break through into that uh, corporate space and I often see, you know, there's there's so many things to do and we can, particularly for businesses that are starting up, they can get quite easily and quite quickly into that realm of burnout. So supporting them in setting those, those plans that are inclusive of self is really priority number one. I like that. And um, I quite like the fact that you schedule everything else because then you know what is in alignment with what you want to become and, and you know, what is expected of you. Whereas a lot of people get burnt out because now they notice they've come to the end of the day, but they haven't actually done the things that they wanted to do. And that whole overwhelm to want to race against time is what then maybe creates, you know, that whole, uh, you know, disharmony or dis-ease that then um, culminates from that. Now, you also mentioned that you're working with other, um, you know, healthcare providers that you're helping them as small businesses. Uh, part of the people that listen to this show are also small to medium business owners. Now, what, what sort of advice would you give um, you know, to these small to medium businesses that are looking to incorporate maybe wellness strategies either into their own daily lives or into their organizations. Because mm. with what you do, you empower organizations through, you know, the health of their people and the well-beings of their business and life as a whole. 
Yeah, so there's essentially there's two components to my business. So I work with large organisations supporting the well-being and performance of the organisation, and then I support other wellness business owners and experts in how to work in that corporate health space because it's a the global wellness international market is priced approximately around $44 billion. And that's uh, looking to exceed to $87 billion in the next eight years. So this market is significantly increasing and growing. Uh, I've seen a really significant shift. So I'm seeing a lot of other business uh, owners and experts wanting to tap into this market, but they're not really sure how to. So within our wellness business hub, I educate and mentor other wellness businesses on how they can tap into this ever-increasing growing market so that they can have a sustainable business model so that they can leverage their impact working with more people and they can ultimately leverage their income within their business uh, businesses. So uh, this, this happened quite organically. I just had people from around the world reaching out to me via messenger hey chris how do i do what you do and i started letting them know and then i've i've built a membership portal so people can come in and we can educate them on all the things business acumen how to expand and 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 grow their wellness business so that's that's been a, a lot of fun i love doing that mm. and um is this the business well-being business hub that you've created yeah, so we call it the Wellness Business Hub. I have a free Facebook group. Perhaps you'll pop it in the notes. People are more than welcome to join our free Facebook group. And then if you want to join up as a member, we can have a chat. I can join up as a member where you can go through the steps of it, it basically increasing your impact and your income in your business and having a sustainable business model that sees you working with more people ultimately and helping more people. Mm, I quite like that. And um, yeah, definitely. I'll be putting those links in the show notes so that people can get started on this journey, because I feel like what you're doing really, really matters because your whole goal was to prevent people from, um, you know, actually ending up in that palliative, palliative care that you, you know, you spent most of your life uh, doing. And um, part of the things that you uh, wanted to figure out was there's got to be a way that we, you know, don't have a lot of people coming, you know, through the doors of emergency every now and again, and also repeat offenders. Now, since you have been in this sort of um, on the other side, you know, now you're doing the wellness, you're doing the cleaner side of things. And at least you can talk to people like myself, because I don't think you would have been able to do that in, in, you know, during the emergency days. Can you maybe tell us about a particularly rewarding moment or maybe a success story that you've experienced, um, you know, with Wellness Works? Um, maybe it's a business that literally changed their bottom line or an individual that actually started looking after themselves and is a happier existence. And since this is um, you know, of a health sort of related, you don't necessarily need to mention names of those that are past, present or anything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, many success stories. I guess one that's highlighted that comes to mind was an organisation contacted me and they said, Chris, we've got a lot of stress. Everybody's stressed in our workplace. Can you come in and fix it? And I said, all right, well, so I go through my normal process where the first thing I do is come in and do a needs analysis. I need to understand, well, are they stressed, first of all? Why are they stressed? What's the underlying triggers? What's happening in the workplace? What have they done that's worked? What, what What's not working? What do we need to do? Are the services that I have aligned? So it's a, it's a process, right? So after doing the needs analysis, which usually takes about a month, we discovered that over 50% of this workplace was stressed and we found that ultimately as a result of the stress, there was many of the employees opting out, burning out and, and leaving. So there was a very high staff turnover. We calculated that it was actually over uh, half a million dollars that they were losing per annum with staff turnover over alone and not to mention all the other KPIs that they weren't meeting 
because they were stressed. So there was a significant loss of profits within this organization. So after doing my investigation, I found that the underlying trigger to the stress was the CEO who employed me to come and fix the stress. So that was a real challenge within itself because the guy paying the bill is ultimately the problem. So I ended up working with that organisation for about 12 months, predominantly working with that CEO, with the, the leadership style, with their emotional intelligence and improving upon that, with improving upon healthier communication And so getting to the heart and the trigger of the problem, what that ultimately did, it's alleviated all the stress for all the employees They had a leader that was leading them effectively, that was able to communicate nicely and proactively, that was able to um, combat and manage their own emotions so they weren't blowing up and stressing everyone out. And When I did my comparative report after 12 months, which I always do with organisations, we reduced the staff turnover by 80% and we reduced the stress component by 35%. So we had over 50 and there was still probably about 15 that were experiencing stress, which is pretty normal. So um, we had a really significant impact and I completely changed that organisation around and changed that leader ultimately around to just a more happier, harmonious, productive uh, work environment. And then so you had the salespeople who now are not stressed meeting their KPIs, meeting their sales targets, which all then has improvements in the ultimately the bottom line of the business. So not only are we helping the employees mitigate, manage their, their stresses and their well-being, but we're also helping the well-being of the organisation. And there was one particular staff member that was so overwhelmed and so stressed and emotional eating and overweight and, and high blood pressure and um, really challenged with a lot of risk factors contributing to potential heart disease. I thought this guy's a sure candidate for a heart attack with knowing my experience. And I worked with him also independently he reduced his weight, he reduced his blood pressure back to normal. And I know for certain, I know for certain he I stopped, I prevented him from having a heart attack because he was he was heading down that trajectory. So in all in all, that was a very um significant um and you know just beautiful result when I know that I've prevented someone to go to hospital. I'm like, yeah, that was a good day in business. That was worthwhile. Oh, fantastic. That that is a totally good uh, you know uh, testimonial right there because so many people are going to jobs and work that's giving them nothing but a hospital bill and if you can reduce that for them I think you're creating um, you know a happier existence for a lot of people because that also trickles down like you say from the CEO to the employees those employees are also going to be trickling that down to their families their kids cats dogs everybody else is bearing the brunt of that one CEO um, who's making a ruckus for everybody else so thank you so much for making the world a little bit better for that um, you know collective <laughs> of people right there. Now, obviously, Christine, we could go on and on. I mean, well-being is such a, um, you know, diverse sort of subject and things of that nature, but there's always that skeptical person in the room and especially that person who would have read uh, the recent Oxford um, findings. And, you know, like you were saying earlier on, there's always an either or somebody's always on the other side, depending on what narrative they're pushing. But they say that there's apparently no evidence um, that uh, all these individual mental health interventions or wellness uh, being actually benefit employees according to what um, they have studied because they say they studied over 40,000 UK workers but maybe they have issues of their own there I I wouldn't be able to say that Um, and they found that mindfulness resilience stress management relaxation classes or well-being um, you know endeavors to not actually improve any of their well-being 
I don't know. What's your comment to that? Um, yeah, know, yeah. I think I think there there may be some truth in that, and and hear me out now because I think what's happening with a lot of wellness programs, it's hit and miss. It's tick the box. It's like, hey, here we are. We're 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 doing this great thing, and we're putting out a fruit bowl, and we have an exercise class, and we have. Um, you know, someone you can talk to if you're not not feeling great. But it's hit and miss because it's like, well, what are the needs? What are the desires? And what are the challenges within within the organization? So I think a lot of programs are just for show and they're not actually getting results. So there probably is some underlying truth to their statements. So what is really important is doing that needs analysis. That is priority number one. You need to know what's going on in that organization in order to fix it. Just like when you go to the doctor, the doctor's not going to go, oh, maybe we'll just try this and here have this pill. They do a full examination. They assess you from head to toe. They come up with their diagnosis and they look at the potential, you know, differing solutions and you find what's the best solution for your diagnosis. So that's my business model. That's the way I operate. I assess the business, I diagnose the problem, and then I medicate and rehabilitate through my services. And in in so by doing, it's fit for purpose and I get benefits, results, outcomes. And we can see that through the comparative report that I provide for organisations, we can see the trajectory of graphs going, we started here and everything was low and there was problematic and then these are the results now. So I'll get pre and post surveys, I'll do interviews, I'll collate a lot of data to show the tangible evidence of the outcomes, benefits, or results that we actually are achieving. Now, on a global scale, you know, the, the global wellness uh, corporate market wouldn't be exceeding for $40 billion in the next eight, eight years if it wasn't working. People wouldn't be investing that much money if it wasn't working. You can get results. But what ultimately what is important is to provide find the provider that's going to, that has a history of success that can show evidence so it's evidence-based and can provide you with those tangible results as opposed to, oh, let's try this and tick the box approach. So that's my recommendation for organisations who are wanting to implement wellness, utilise a provider, or if you're doing it internally, ensure that you're doing that uh, assessment to get the right diagnosis, to get the right solution that's fit for purpose. Fantastic. You see, you know what I like about what you have created here? First of all, it's a unique combination of ingredients. First, you've seen what it's like when people are about to die and you know what it's like for them to not be in that position. So many people maybe just walk through a couple of calls on a weekend and then, you know, uh, call themselves a coach. And, you know, you, you know, the kind that we're talking about, but you've been on both extremes. And I think you're strategically positioned to be the one person that actually prevents or the buck actually stops with you so that there's not any of those medical machines. You know how people can actually stop that. So um, I, I just value the work that you're doing and all this stemmed from tonsils. You know, because you said when you were seven years old, you were lying in bed and the nurse was being authoritative and showed you the way. And obviously, as a seven year old, you would stop and listen, because I know your parents wouldn't have talked to you that way. Now, looking back at that little girl who was looking an hour at that nurse with a clipboard and telling you all the orders and everything else, if you would have been that nurse who you later on became, what would you have said to that little girl if maybe she would have asked, hey, what's your job like? And what sort of advice would you give to that girl if she says, I want to be just like you? Oh, gee, that's that's a very poignant but challenging question, Prosma. What, what would I say to that little girl? Um, I just think it's about, 
I think we have an innate ability when we look within to know who we are, what we need, and what is important to us in what we then produce to the world and what we show the world. And the more we stop and breathe and look in to understand ourselves and be genuine and authentic in doing the thing that makes us who we are, the the better off we are going to be ultimately and the better off the world is going to be. And, And I think that comes with wellness as well, because often we're so busy and tied up with with life that we don't stop and go, hmm, what's this little niggle of a headache? Is that because I'm dehydrated? Was I feeling a bit tired? Do I need to rest? So when we look within and ask ourselves some questions and essentially coach ourselves, we have the the biofeedback will give us the information that we need at any given time to make the right decision, what's right for us and not get distracted what's around us in those shiny bright lights. So don't look externally, but look within. So if I was that nurse, I would have said to that little girl, look within, do what's in your gut, do go with what's in your heart and be your true authentic self in the world. Wow. And, and that you did. Mm. So congratulations to seven-year-old Christine who was wriggling in the bed with tonsillitis and uh, look what you've given and the gift you've given to the world. Well, I can't thank you enough for the time that we've spent on the call today, but it will be remiss for me to ask because you, you've gone on a journey from, you know, like as I described, bedside care to boardroom brilliance. Um, and, you know, you've just done that in sort of one lifetime. There's got to be more that's left. And you're now helping other people, um, you know, you know, do the same and create businesses for themselves that are profitable and enjoyable. What's next? Where, where does this frontier? Well, what's next? I'm working currently on a big project and it is what I'm trying to achieve is I'm implementing health coaches into non-for-profit organisations within rural regional Australia because there's a real gap with resources, you know, GP, psychologists, et cetera. So our health coaches can really act as a conduit between people on the farm and, and small businesses in rural regional Australia where there's a high incidence of chronic disease and a high incidence of suicide. They can work with people in the low realm of basic health care and acting as a conduit, supporting them to get them to uh, the right health care professionals, whether that's online or face-to-face. So we've built a program called the ADAPT program, a Detect and Protect Training Program. And this program trains health coaches to work in things like bush nursing centres, rural hospitals, uh, financial counselling centres, any non-for-profit organisation that's essentially working with the community. And so this program educates those health coaches in a case management framework to deliver a, we've piloted it and it's been successful, a successful wellness program for their community in order that their community then has improved health and well-being and has improved accessibility and equity with the healthcare sector, all whilst reducing the risk of suicide and the risk of disease. So this is a program we're just getting off the ground. I've, I've, I've launched it here in Gippsland where I live, looking to scale it right across rural regional Australia. And, um, you know, in my mind, ultimately the more people I can support that are educating around wellness, then ultimately for me, which is quite greedy and selfish, but the more people I'm keeping out of hospital, because if I help others to help others, like I'm having a much wider uh, intensive reach so i'm really excited about this program the adapt program oh wow and have you ever seen millions and millions and millions of dollars are spent every single year meeting just to fix world health and yet one single lady from gippsland has managed to figure out exactly what needs to happen I just wish a lot of people get 
you know, the extensiveness of what you're creating, because if you can't do well, or if you can't, you know, show up healthy in, in your own realm, then obviously you can't, um, you know, produce and be a functional member of society, which means work, your relationships and everything else suffer. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time with me on the show today and really getting deep into what it is that you guys are working on. So thank you. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Prosper. You, you asked some very interesting questions and you get me excited about, you know, what I do and what I'm passionate about. So it just it brings it all out when I talk about it. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, there you have it, folks. A deep dive into the world of wellness with the incredible Christine. But wait, the journey doesn't even end here. If you found today's episode as enlightening as I did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more game-changing insights from the Online Prosperity Show. And I want you to remember one thing. Your well-being is the greatest asset. You want to guard it with everything you've got. Until next time, keep prospering and stay healthy out there. Bye for now.